Good morning. Welcome to worship on this, the uh, 16th day of August. We trust that uh, you've had a good week and that uh, you are now uh, anticipating the opportunity to uh, pause and reflect on the way in which uh, God's tender mercy is around you. Let us begin by uh, with a pause as we listen to the prelude as Colleen shares it. Gracious Lord God, as we gather this day, why we trust that your spirit works in and through us and in the midst of those things that oftentimes why confuse us, why we pray that, uh, that you might be a marvelous resource to us, uh, opening our hearts and our lives in such a way that we recognize and indeed uh, claim you uh, as Lord and Savior. Grace us now as we worship, for we pray in Jesus' name. Let us sing, Open Our Eyes, Lord, twice. Oh 
Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. Amen. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin. Please use this time of silence for your own personal prayer. Reconciling God, we confess that we do not trust your abundance and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us. And in your spirit, lead us. So that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Amen. Beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with God through Christ Jesus, through whom we have obtained grace upon grace. Our sins are forgiven. Let us live now in hope, for hope does not disappoint, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let us join now in singing When Morning Gilds the Skies, verses 1, 2, 4, and 5. Teach us as disciples of your Son to love the world with compassion and constancy, that your name may be known throughout the earth, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. The first reading is from the 56th chapter of Isaiah, beginning with verse 1. Thus says the Lord, maintain justice and do what is right, for soon my salvation will come and my deliverance will be revealed. 
and the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath and do not profane it, and hold fast my concern. These will I bring to my body, my, my holy mountain, and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Thus says the Lord God, who gathers the outcasts of Israel. I will gather others to them besides those already gathered. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us join in singing the song. We'll begin with the antiphon verse. The second reading is from the 11th chapter of Romans, beginning with verse 2 and continuing with 29 through 32. Paul writes, I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew, for the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Just as you were once disobedient to God, but have now re received mercy because of their disobedience, so they have now been disobedient in order that, by the mercy shown to you, they too may now receive mercy. For God has imprisoned all in disobedience, so that he may be merciful to all. Here ends the reading. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 15th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus called the crowd to him and said to them, Listen and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but it is what comes out of the mouth that defiles. Then the disciples approached and said to him, do you know that the Pharisees took offense when you heard what you said? He answered, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be uprooted. Let them alone. They are blind guides of the blind. 
And if one blind person guides another, both will fall into a pit. But Peter said to him, Explain this parable to us. Then he said, Are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth enters the stomach and goes out into the sewer? But what comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart, and that is what defiles. For out of the heart come evil intentions, murder, adultery, fornication, theft, false witness, slander. These are what defile a person, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile. Jesus left that place and went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. Just then a Canaanite woman from that region came out and started shouting, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But he did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she keeps shouting after us. He answered, I was only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. He answered, It is not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed instantly. The Gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Some thoughts as we consider this words of this gospel lesson. We could begin by noting that this is one feisty woman, or at the risk of irreverence, we could begin by noting that Jesus is one very rude man. But rather than focus on one or the other, I suggest we explore the relationship unfolding in this remarkable gospel story and then ask about the implications for us. The presenting problem in Jesus' encounter with the Canaanite woman is the contempt of Jesus' people for outsiders. It was not supposed to be this way. They were meant to be a conduit for God's blessing for all the nations of the earth, as we learn in the early chapters of Genesis where we read, I will bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Instead, they have hoarded the blessing for themselves and perverted it into arrogance, entitlement, and contempt. It is shocking to see Jesus first ignore this woman, and then to hear her hear him effectively call her a dog. But Jesus is only saying out loud, what the people have come to believe in their hearts. I wonder if this is not continuing to play out before our eyes, even in this time, with the way women are often portrayed by those in positions of authority. That the encounter between Jesus the Jew and this woman, a Gentile, even occurred was remarkable enough. But the fact that Matthew chose to tell it and not erase it from history makes it astounding. After all, this woman was not just any Gentile. She was a Canaanite, and as such represented a despised indigenous rural population with whom Jews were forbidden to associate. Yet she, this despised outsider, addresses Jesus as Lord, Son of David, and revealed herself to be a believer and not merely a pagan from Canaan. That in itself is worth noting. But what about Jesus? His initial reaction was so offensive that some have argued that it didn't happen. It was planted by Jewish Christians who didn't approve of the church's mission to the Gentiles. But Gentiles, Christians later added the happy ending to prove their point. Then there are those who want to clean up the story by claiming that when Jesus refers to dogs, why he's using the Arabic diminutive, that means that he was referring to household pets like a term of endearment. Some say he was merely testing the woman's faith, as if that makes his behavior any better. It's hard to take a direct connection between the daughter's possession here and the attitudes Jesus 
and his disciples display, but we have learned in our own time that racial and ethnic marginalization correlate with higher rates of poverty and illness in the affected groups. So it is not unreasonable to suspect such a connection. The damage of sin is not only direct and personal, it is also insidious and pervasive. So this presenting problem proceeds from a misplaced trust. Jesus' people have come to trust not in God, but in their status as special people. This is a problem of the heart, which Jesus has been addressing from the beginning of this chapter here in Matthew. It is another manifestation of the fact that their hearts are far from God. Recently, I have heard some speak of American exceptionalism. This theory postulates that the history of the United States is inherently different from that of other nations. Secondly, it implies that America has a unique mission to transform the world. And thirdly, is the sense that Americans' history and its mission give it superiority over other nations. So we must ask the question, whom or what are we trusting when we marginalize others? Is it not our own status, whether racial, economic, or cultural? Is it not ourselves as normative, the standard by which others would be judged? Is it not our agency, our control over our own fates? Anything on which your heart relies and depends, I say, that is really your God. Martin Luther writes in his explanation to the first commandment in the large catechism, a heart not set on God is a heart opposed to God and defiles us in God's eyes. In fact, it would seem to make God our enemy. The consequences of our idolatry are breaking out all around us in these difficult days of global pandemic and national racial reckoning. These consequences have laid bare what used to be hidden, the literal meaning of apocalypse who would save us now as we cry out in desperation. Jesus will. Jesus is the one who bears our sin onto the cross and suffers its consequences in a humiliating and painful death, just as he suffers himself to be bested in this argument with the Canaanite woman. Jesus has bigger fish to fry than mere retribution for our wrongdoing. He will do whatever it takes to save us from ourselves, whatever it costs him, trusting that his path through humiliation and death leads to life in abundance for himself and for us. Martin Luther, in writing about this story, said, So she catches Christ, the Lord, in his own words, and with that wins not only the right of a dog, but also that of the children. Now then, where, where will he go, our dear Jesus? He let himself be made captive and must comply. Be sure of this, that's what he most deeply desires. By such tenacity and unflinching faith, the Lord is taken captive and pressed to answer. O oh, woman, you cling firmly to the hope that I will help you and you don't let go of me. Great is your faith. The source of the Canaanite woman's great faith is a mystery to me. Why would she trust Jesus, especially when he speaks to her as he does? Had she heard of his great compassion for those in need, those without hope? Was she bearing the image of her creator in her willingness to give up everything, even to be regarded as a dog for the sake of her beloved daughter? Where will our faith come from as our false gods go so catastrophically fail before us? What could possibly turn our trust to God, our love of self to love for others? Could it be the promise of God's self-giving love for us in Jesus Christ, despite our great sin and enmity with God? I would hope that we too might cry out, yes, Lord, save me. The result of the woman's great faith is that her daughter is instantly restored to health. It seems to me that in her case, her great love for her daughter was a source for her great faith in Jesus. But I wonder about the disciples standing by. How did they react to Jesus extolling this foreign woman's great faith while he continually pointed out their little faith? I trust you will recall that in the story we heard last week, Jesus say to Peter, you of little faith, why did you doubt? 
Were their hearts at all open to this woman they wanted to get rid of only a few moments ago? Did their attitudes soften at all toward, toward their Gentile neighbors in the days and weeks that follow? I have to believe they got there eventually. After all, they are the ones who bore the gospel into the world after Jesus' resurrection and ascension. But what about us? We are the ones now hearing this story, which is an integral part of the fuller story of Jesus' saving love for us. Will we see the implication for our own lives, our own attitudes, our own allegiances? That, I think, is largely up to the work of the Holy Spirit. But if we persist in the disciples' task of bearing the gospel to the world, we can be sure that lives will be transformed, and maybe ours included. And this, dear siblings in Christ, is the good news that this gospel lesson offers to us this morning. The Jesus of hate and fear, of war and death, the Jesus who would call a woman a dog, this is not our God. We do not need to believe in this one. More than that, as the Canaanite woman shows, it is the call of faith to resist him. We must not let ourselves confuse this false Jesus with our Lord and Savior. When something terrible happens in the world, when someone dies, when a pandemic engulfs us, when a pastor or congregation does something inexcusable, we know that this is the inevitable end of sin and brokenness in the world. We mourn these with, not in spite of our Lord. We, like the Canaanite woman, pray to our Lord and Savior, Jesus, heal us, knowing that he will provide. Our Jesus seeks out the least, the last, and the lost. Our Jesus comes for Jew and Canaanite, for those in Mosul and Ferguson, in Liberia and Sierra Leone, in Palestine, in Israel, in Chicago, and even here in Omaha. Our Jesus would go from heaven to earth, from life to death, through hell to resurrection life, so that each of us might know God's amazing love. Our Jesus feeds us a rich feast. It is not just crumbs that he offers. We will not be satisfied with ceasefires, vaccines for only a few, or a stopgap change in police power. Jesus offers his own body and blood for us at the table of the Holy Communion. We believe in a promise of God's kingdom coming to our world just as completely. Come, Lord Jesus, come and heal us. Let us pray. Gracious Lord God, we give you thanks for the witness of this woman and for her deep faith that enables her to challenge Jesus in order that he might respond with your grace and mercy. We are grateful that you respond to each of us as we come before you. May your spirit touch our hearts and lives, and may we in turn live faithfully, trusting that your goodness and grace accompany us as we seek to be your goodness in this world now. For this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us join in singing Healer of Our Every Ill.
With the whole church, let us confess our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We turn to the back of the celebrate insert for our prayers of this day. Confident of your care and helped by the Holy Spirit, we pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Lord, you gather the church to be part of your mission as ambassadors of Jesus Christ. As Jesus acknowledged the great faith of a woman from outside his people, help your church discover and find blessing in the faith of people we might reject. Lord, in your mercy, Hear our prayer. You have blessed us with the bounty of the earth. Grant your grace to all your creatures, that the earth will flourish. Relieve waters choked by garbage, renew soils stripped of nutrients, and refresh the air all creatures need to live. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. prayer. You call the nations to be glad and sing for joy. Let your way be known among all the nations of the world, now divided by competing interests, contending alliances, and consumed by enormous worry. Bless us and make your face shine upon all. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. You show unexpected mercy, kindness, and generosity. We pray for those who do not have enough, for outcasts in our villages, cities, and town, and for those who need your healing, especially all those we hold dear in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, our prayer. prayer. In you we live and move and have our being. Grant our congregation grace to find our life refreshed in you. Accompany us in the rhythms of late summer. Give us rest and renewal, and strengthen us for mission in your name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Your eternal promises are more than we could ever imagine. As you gather all the saints, join us also with them on the great day of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. In the certain hope that nothing can separate us from your love, we offer these prayers to you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Peace to you from our Lord Jesus Christ. When our congregation last gathered for the celebration of Holy Communion, we heard the story of God's mighty acts and of the love shown to us in the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. With thanksgiving, 
we remember that in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks, he broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. May the precious body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace now and forever. Amen. Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus, God the Creator, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit the Comforter, bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen. Our closing song is, O Sing to the Lord. Blessed day and a blessed week.